conversation with Anthony Watson and he'll tell you a little bit about himself and what he does and um, then we're going to hear some really interesting news. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I grew up and born in Derby yeah, and then um, travelled along the Fitzroy River, a lot of seed and all the family connection. Um, I'd done my early days of schooling, then went to Broome, done um, my year eight, nine and ten. I uh, come back to Mount Anderson, which um, is a family property and a lot of our heritage and growing up on the station. Um, so that's that's me um, in my early days and um, my dad being involved with the land council, uh, I wanted to join him at the march when, when in the Nukunwa days. Um, and that was new towards having industries coming up to the region and what that was like and whether they was going to respect us in, our, in the country that I grew up in and all of our um, relationship with land and what it means for us and that we lived off the land. Um, so just the time I saw a lot of changes in wanting to, um, all these other people wanting to change our parcel lease into other proposal. Um, and um, so I joined the land council after dad was um, part of the 1993 Native Title Act, 92, 93. And he was the chairman back then. Um, so I took interest into what is community development, um, what um, being a parcel manager, uh, being a parcel worker. So well, most of my life that I wanted to be. Um, but yeah, things change. Uh, and we had to brace all of these new changes. And um, so I joined the Native Title um, with the Land Council um, in wanting to get recognition for our traditional owners. So we're close to 95, close to 100% of the Kimberley being claimed um, and land being recognised by the courts, the high courts, and um, for the judge to actually give recognition back to traditional owners has been awesome. Uh, so it, it has been part of my journey in building myself up. Um, but you, you do meet challenge. Um, we had a gas project at James Fry's Point, um, and it's involved my mum's country. So I had to go and um, help my, my people from my mum's side. And I was part of, the, um, part of the team and got nominated as a named applicant. And to, to, um, to be involved, what was um, a development at a high, big level um, within our area. So we never dreamt of these things. They um, um, been put on our lap to actually how we work with these new changes. So um, we made sure that environmental and cultural values got protected. Um, it was a big agreement during the time. Um, so we wanted to make sure that um, our country and our people get looked after. Um, so they some of my journey that I went through um, beside the native title process and helping PBCs to be established um, for the self-determination and independence of um, all the tr tribes within our region. Um, so they are slowly getting in towards what is PBC beyond native title. Um, and my background as a community development officer and the chair of our community that um, the native title was one thing, yeah, um, a tick in a box. Um, we had all of the social issues that um, we had to take care of. Um, there was cultural maintenance that we had to take care of and I got involved with um, the CALAC board and I was the youngest member to actually go in there to actually do project. And out of that process um, in 2020, the new millennium that, um, not 2002, uh, 2000, that uh, we developed the European project and it was to get work skills, life skills and cultural skills um, to try and to embrace our younger generation to find their identity and how they move forward within this, this new world. Um, we come across the Northern Development wanting to develop our region. What does that mean for us? Um, and big population growth, a lot of activities beyond mining and parcel and um, horticulture, agriculture. So these were projects that were proposed for the Kimberley and still are. Um, and how do we cope with it and how we um, 
live in this modern world and what is the modern world? Um, well, my dad came from the bush. Yeah, my mum was um, in a mission, uh, born in uh, within Broome and roamed um, between Beagle Bay and Broome. Um, and uh, trying to capture this new changing environment, what it means for us and um, how we make sure that we got our security to protect you know, our lands, um, our culture, uh, and our people. So I, I, I work towards um, trying to find security, towards making sure our people are well off and um, adapt to this new world. And, um, and that's, that's been my challenge over the, over the few years or since I've been in politics. So I've been in the land council for 28 years as a director and it's seven years as a chairperson. So um, I've been um, involved myself with a lot of stuff towards wanting to look at closing the gap um, for our people. So I, I, I live most of my life and between me and my parents and our family that we contributed maybe about half a century towards um, trying to find a balance for our mob to fit into this new lifestyle um, because that's all we've got. Our basic um, background um, and our lifestyle is revolved around our land. Um, our river is a part of our, the landscape um, and they are the stuff that we need to, we have been protecting um, and we need to make sure that it works for us and take care of us for the next um, century and beyond. Um, so they, they just struggle. Um, people seem to lose that um, direction um, and take um, our direction as misunderstood. Yeah, and that's our challenge, that um, we need to create a pathway um, to secure our, our, our community and my family and other families how are they going to live within this region of the Kimberley, um, which I am from? Uh, the, uh, Anthony, you mentioned about the, the Kimberley um, Law and Culture Centre. And how important is it to make sure that uh, the cultural bosses still have that cultural authority? Um, in other words, you know, that sometimes there's interference um, from legislation that comes from the Western system. So how important is it um, that um, senior people uh, can retain that authority um, even where bad legislation um, is, is a barrier. How does that work? Um, I had to grow up in knowing that um, a lot of the legislations and acts that get put into place does affect mm -hmm. us um, badly. Um, our concern is with this new heritage bill um, that is proposed and um, just going through the, the details and what it means for us um, yeah, that, that's a lot of the challenge that we got. So mm -hmm. um, it is a concern um, and we need to call on this government to actually say, well, um, and we do have a voice and mm -hmm. we need our voice to be heard towards making sure that um, these future acts actually um, evolve around us, that we're part of the decision making. It, it's, it's our heritage, it's our country that um, we've got native title recognitions. Um, so it, I, it's hard to understand that this government talk about uh, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the challenges that we've got to say, well, these laws are in place, these actions are in place, but it's not followed through. So it, it's mm -hmm. for me as a young fellow growing up um, and knowing all of these things meant to work and it doesn't work and um, and if it does work it works against us um, so it's disheartening it is and, and there's some of those um really strange uh sections in in that bill um, that don't allow for disclosure can you explain that to everybody and what that means in the current um, heritage bill in western australia yeah. there um there's a lot of things that we need to clear up. We're not asking mm -hmm. for veto, but we should be given veto. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we need, it's our heritage. We need to be in a decision-making process um, towards um, decision about our culture. So mm -hmm. well, there's things that we've seen so far and what was presented, and we're working off those um, proposal from the um, state government is that um, 
the mining companies determine what is low, medium, and high mm -hmm. impact, and um, they may not not they can establish um, come across sites where it is very high, um, but they can downgrade it to no low impact, which mm -hmm. is does affect us. And so, and so what does it mean in this heritage bill? People have been talking about Section 18. What does that mean? Uh, the issue of Section 18 has destroyed um, a site. Um, we, under the gas project, we said not to use the Section 18. We agreed with the government to um, do a project there. Uh, they did do a Section 18, and um, Section 18 has been branded a new um, number. Mm -hmm. So Section 18 is still there and it can destroy sites like the Jukun Bush. Mm. And, and so what are other things that um, really uh, don't feel right in this bill? That, you know, we, we hear also that um, a, a number of people across Australia from different communities are supporting um, you and, and communities in Western Australia that they see as unfair. What other issues are, really don't sit well with community? Yeah, one of the issues is that um, we could get penalised as Indigenous people for withholding uh, heritage knowledge. And um, so it makes it um, difficult for me to learn culture from my dad um, because I got the knowledge. Um, it's difficult if I do tell my kids and they could be liable for fines. So these are some of the stuff that um, we're trying to sort out with this government to... Um, say we um, you haven't settled with us on that so there is some um, penalty for organizations and individuals like myself um, mm -hmm. if we don't come forward um, and share that knowledge and we have um, protocol too that um, you cannot put this stuff up on for display when it's um, restricted evidence mm -hmm. um, so we can't have everyone seeing it um, so it, it, this bill, we see it as making it easy for the mining industry. Uh, it, it should be an Aboriginal Act, not a mining act. Um, and um, yeah, so there is difficult and I, I worry that if we can't transfer, I can't transfer that knowledge to the younger generation and my kids, then um, whether it's, it, it's a cultural genocide. So these are issues that we have to toy with um, and break down that bill the proposed bill towards what it means for mm -hmm. us. So, um, but the minister hasn't hasn't um, actually showed us. We are asking him to show mm -hmm. us um, his changes. Um, because he keep falling back to saying that he has consulted, um, but yeah, that's not good enough. Okay, and and one of the big issues too that we heard a number of years ago was that the minister can actually deregister sites. Is this the, the same situation in the current bill, the heritage bill? Um, yeah, there, there's a number of disappointing points within the bill. Um, so we're mm -hmm. still waiting for the minister, but it needs to be a three-way conversation. Mm -hmm. The mining industry need to be part of the table in negotiation, this negotiation, this new proposed bill. Uh, we'll feel more comfortable uh, and more comfortable mm. by the other industry. Um, because the stuff that we've been working through, it's, it's working why they want to have this change which takes us backwards. Mm. Uh, so it, it's more worse than the previous bill or the, the mm. current bill. Um, and it was meant to have an opportunity to, um, to make something better. Yeah. And it's very unique in the Kimberley because... The Kimberley Land Council was formed from a people's movement. You know, many other land councils are formed in different reasons, but with Nukumba, um, and and your father, John Watson, was also there. Yeah, the dad, dad yeah. went to it and he said that um, he's going to go on march and he's going to get arrested. Mm. I wanted to go with him. Um, he was worried by, about my safety and if he get arrested. Um, so I stayed home. I didn't like that, but, um, but yeah, it's a <laughs> council form, um, mm. and we formed on that, you don't, we didn't mind that you can do mining and other activities in other areas, but please don't touch our sacred sites, mm. 
Um, so part of that we grew to actually say um, no means no um, and don't touch our sacred site. So we got more stronger um, and um, more smarter towards actually dealing in um, working with the mining industry to have their projects go forward. Um, so it, it seems silly that this government actually um, want to create something which is uh, discriminatory towards us. And I guess one of the things that you're looking at too is free prior and informed consent. Is that the same as a veto or do you think free prior and informed consent, if we could explain that to a lot of people listening tonight? Um, I, I have definitely done free prior and informed consent, but yeah, it's, it's for us and mm. for us to um, determine what is high um, mm. heritage issues um, and for us to make a decision um, towards what what's, um, should be done for our region. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we, we're in the Kimberley, which is um, have um, a lot of minerals and basin. Um, there, um, we've got over a thousand years of energy um, with uranium gas, oil, uh, mineral sands, um, arsenic, and um, but yeah, we, we we know that government would want to do um, go into our country. We know the mining company want to go into it but it needs to be regulated. Um, so we can't have um, the mining company and the government regulate um, something for us. Um, we have to be part of it. And that's really important with the people's movement. And I think probably that's what we're going to see in that space in Western Australia with um, protests against the Cultural Heritage Bill and, and a lot of support that you're going to have for community um, and in the way that people can really spell out what's wrong and, and make it right. And I guess that's all about NAIDOC week is making sure that we respect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And that means also making good law, um, making sure that, that the law works for, for community. So thank you so much, Anthony. We're just gonna go and uh, have, a, have a yarn with Cato and then we'll come back and have a, a Q and A. Thanks so much, Anthony. Cato, thank you so much. Um, can you just tell um, everyone listening tonight a little bit about yourself and, and your experience and exactly what makes you get up in the morning and uh, want to fight on? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so Kato Muir is the name. I'm uh, coming to you from my hometown of Leonora, which is uh, out on the edge of the desert and the Goldfields region of Western Australia. Um, about 80, 90 k's north of where I'm sitting now is a place called Weibo, and Weibo is a very important Aboriginal site, uh, part of a major dreaming track. And in 1968 and 69, a prospector pegged a lease over that site to take uh, the sacred stones away and used in ornamental fireplaces. Um, my elders at that time stood up against him uh, between 1969 to 1970. And it was actually an unusual thing to be doing out in this country, uh, standing up against uh, the white man, um, as uh, many experiences of many other uh, First Nations peoples from throughout Australia have, uh, you know, the uh, policies were often enforced at the end of a barrel of a gun. And so it took a lot of courage for them to stand up and push back. And what uh, came out of that um, fight was the current Aboriginal Heritage Act. And it was amended a couple of times. The other time you referred to with Anthony there was uh, in 1980. So the legislation was introduced in 1972, um, amended in 1980 as a result of the Nukumba, uh protests. And this piece of legislation has served to protect our heritage and our culture. And I think one, one of the misconceptions we need to 
strike away immediately is that these places are our religious places. They're our sacred places. That's where we um, engage with uh, the divine in that sense. And legislation aimed at uh, development approvals uh, and archaeological assessments uh, are basically uh, preventing us from exercising our spiritual uh, inheritance. And the experience that we have today is as a result of the, um, the devastation uh, caused by Rio Tinto at uh, Jukan Gorge. Um, the other bits of information that come through about uh, the Marindu experience where the state government in Western Australia introduced a special piece of legislation to excise an area of land from uh, the operation of the Aboriginal Heritage Act. We then find out uh, within the last few weeks that um, of the 100 plus different sites there, about 20 were excavated and the archaeological material were later dumped by Rio Tinto and what was then Charles, oh, prior to Charles Darwin University, when it was NTU, uh, were dumped at the uh, Darwin rubbish tip. And so the experience that we have as uh, First Nations, Aboriginal people with uh, cultural connections to our heritage and our culture that we share um, with our other brothers and sisters along dreaming tracks and other uh, forms of association. We have this awful situation in Western Australia where industry and government collude to ensure the destruction of our heritage. Now, this uh, draft legislation is no different. Uh, it gives the minister all the power uh, the minister was quoted as saying that um, gives uh, Aboriginal people a greater role in decision making, but what it actually does is it actually puts us at the centre of everyone else's decisions, whether they're mining companies or government. And the veto, uh, I'm not afraid to ask for a veto, but the veto is not a veto against development. The veto that we're asking for is a veto against destruction of our sites so that we have the final say on that. It's, um, it's unbelievable that in today's day and age, uh, we have a Minister of the Crown continuing to execute uh, destruction orders against our sites um, without our consent. I'll just give you a couple of figures there. In um, 10 years between um, 2010 to 2020, Ministers, so whether they're Ben Wyatt, uh, Steve Dawson, or Liberal ministers before that, mm. approved 460 applications made by mining companies to destroy protected areas or sacred sites. And in that 10 year period, only one of those applications was rejected. Now, of those 460 applications, we have no idea how many actual sites were in the applications. Um, one application contains about 50 separate sites. So what we're really basically saying to the government today is stop what you're doing, um, come back, talk to us and co-design a heritage protection framework that actually is aimed at protecting, celebrating our culture and our heritage and not to be making assessments based on the social and economic interest of the state. Uh, they, that should be a separate process. What we really need to be looking at is valuing and protecting uh, cultural heritage places uh, based on their inherent uh, cultural heritage values. Mm. So NAIDOC theme this year is heal land and mm. You know, you, you, can't, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to work out what that, uh, why we're talking about healing land. 
healing land because we had one of our most uh, oldest um, heritage places bombed, blown up uh, under the sanction of the state um, with uh, a multinational mining company who doesn't appear to have learned anything, both the state government and the mining company are hoping this issue will go away. They're proceeding as business as usual. The government released a Aboriginal Heritage Act that, um, uh, which they put out for public consultation. We understand today that since that public consultation process, they have redrafted that piece, piece of legislation 20 times uh, without any reference to anyone. Uh, we don't know what goes on behind closed doors. They may be doing it with uh, the hand of the uh, mining companies on the pen, but uh, we don't know that. So our, um, our message to the government is come back to us, co-design legislation that protects our heritage. And it's not about development. Well, I would love to see a piece of legislation that uh, celebrates our culture and our heritage, legislation that um, protects our languages. Uh, this is, you know, this is an opportunity. The minister we have today uh, is from Ireland. My understanding is that he grew up and went to school in an Irish immersion school, so he speaks uh, Gaelic well. And um, why can't we have our Aboriginal languages taught in our schools across Western Australia as part of an Aboriginal heritage protection framework? So th these are the sort of, you know, and it's not as if we're we don't have any money. We're quite a wealthy state. We've been uh, blowing up and destroying Aboriginal sites left, right and centre to generate uh, revenue that now sits in the coffers of government. But uh, they're not willing to share that wealth around. And they've, they basically continue to sideline uh, the First Nations communities. And the great thing about this, though, is that we are actually all coming together. So. I'm part of uh, the Aboriginal Heritage Action Alliance. I'm also part of the National Native Title Council, um, the First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance, which uh, is formed at, the, at a national level, who's actually negotiating with uh, Minister Lay on the, uh, you know, the, on the framework to review the federal heritage legislation. But in Western Australia, none of that is happening. The minister's got his head in the sand the government's uh, riding this huge majority that they've got and they're hoping that um, they can ride roughshod over us and destroy our sites within a legally sanctioned legal framework. And so you mentioned earlier, Virginia, about um, uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Ind Indigenous Peoples. That's right, yeah. That's actually a minimum standard. If, there's, if the laws are introduced today anywhere in Australia, that does not reflect United Nations standards, then those laws are illegitimate. They don't uh, deserve to, the ink on the paper that they're uh, printed on. So, you know, I could go on all night about it, but I think I'll uh, wind down there. What do we learn from this really is that the government is in other states. So Western Australia, just for uh, the viewers out there, Western Australia does not have uh, pokey money. So we don't have pokey machines in Western Australia. We've only got it at the casino in Perth. But unlike the other states in Western Australia, they're all hooked up to pokey revenue. Western Australia is hooked up to mining revenue. And it's the exact same psychological process at play. They're addicted to mining money. Um, and, you know, trample all over our rights, destroy our country, destroy our environment, um, which I think uh, I'll conclude on that little point there, is that internationally and across the world, Jukan has drawn attention to what's going on here. It's also activated uh, the investment community. So responsible investors, uh, the movement of green capital, which I'll talk about on Friday in the next session. Um, those sort of things are now coming into play where mining companies are going to find that they cannot get access to money if they do not treat uh, Indigenous rights 
and environmental rights with uh, the respect that uh, is expected by the society at large. Um, and that's something for the listeners to this uh, presentation to understand Before. is that your money is actually paying for uh, these companies. So you've, you've got the ability to actually put pressure back on uh, industry and government through uh, tracking down what's happening with your money. Thank you. Quick, quick, oh, thank you, Cody. Just a quick question on that before I go to Adrian, is that um, when we look at issues um, and you talked about Duke and Gorge and the terrible situation, um, shocking situation that happened uh, with, with that area being blown up, how does it change uh, when shareholders revolt and uh, put pressure on companies to have people removed, uh, senior bureaucrats um, in the organisation and also a CEO. Do you find that that shareholder um, strength could also um, be replicated throughout Australia to stand up for these yeah. yeah, no, they're absolutely terrified of it. Uh, this is one of the big uh, lies, the other big lies that's being perpetrated by government and industry is okay. that they do not enjoy the prospect of shareholders through their um, uh, fund managers and elsewhere uh, coming back and asking questions and saying, okay, you guys, uh, we need to hold you to account. But fortunately, mm -hmm. that's going on today. You see the uh, example of um, Dutch Shell, I think, being uh, taken to court in The Hague. So these sort of things are happening today. And it's the age of the responsible investor um, who is basically expecting a return on their capital that is uh, conscionable. You know, there's no, no, more, um, no, no more room for doing bad. And I think that's the thing that um, mm -hmm. governments, their responsibility, their sole responsibility is to ensure that laws are written so that uh, people or corporates don't do bad things. That's awesome. So th thanks so much. We'll talk a bit more on that a bit later. Thanks, Cato. Hi, Adrian. Um, thanks so much. You're in your car. We can see that. Yeah. You're Sorry about that. Car. No, no, I think it's great. Um, <laughs> being on a movie, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell a little bit about yourself so people out there know exactly who you are and, and, and what you're actually doing on country and some of the big struggles that are happening on country? Yeah, well, um, I'd like to just start with introducing myself. Uh, my name is Adrian Buragaba. Uh, we belong to the uh, to the uh, Wanganjagalingu country that's out there in the Galilee Basin where the Carmichael coal mine is, where uh, Clyde Palmer's trying to get his mine going in Alpha and Gina Reinhardt. So, um, yeah, our country's uh, rich in mineral resources at the moment. I think I'm at, uh, I don't know, I'm uh, probably in Cubby Cubby country. I'm just driving. I had to stop, but... Um, yeah, well, um, a lot of people probably followed um, our campaign. We had a very effective campaign that we ran against the uh, Adani Carmichael mine uh, and ran over about uh, five, six years. And um, a lot of it was just based on uh, what the people wanted. And so <clears throat> they're, the, they're the fundamental principles on, you know, uh, uh, why, um, you know, I speak about things like... Uh, that you know are, are important to the land. You know, it's 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 the people really that um that uh, I I get the messages from. And so when when the people are not comfortable with uh, negotiations and the process of uh, Iliwas and and Native Title, um, look, I mean, I was an applicant for a while on the Wangan and Jagalingu claim, and I found it very difficult because uh, our people just didn't quite know what to expect or what to do because. You know, they'd walk into a room full of lawyers and, um, I mean, half the time they're being told that, uh, you know, they don't have the traditional decision-making processes and, you know, and uh, they just get bamboozled. And so, um, you know, I've, I've had to sort of contend with that native title process. Uh, my nephew is Tony McAvoy, so he's a senior council barrister. He works in the native title, so um, I have a a little bit of insight in those kind of things because I, I get a bit of advice from him when I can. 
But when it comes to native title, uh, I feel that it is so ambiguous. The native title legislation has so many gray areas in it. From what I've discovered, the five federal court cases we had challenging um, the, the Iliwa process uh, was just so difficult because um, nobody really know, knew, um, you know, w w what it actually um, stipulated. And that was that was that was my problem because, I mean, he, here I was, I presented, I was presented to the court a statement of claim, you know, uh, connecting the totems with the moiety, with the skin names, with the, the marriage system, with with the um, with the law, and all of these things. Basically, my statement of claim was. This is, this is how everything is connected in our country, from the water to the trees, to the, to the animals, to the grass, to all those things. And nobody could contest it. No one could challenge it, not even the court. They just wanted to dismiss it because they used the native total process. And that process was majority rules. And, mm -hmm. and that's why they didn't see what I was doing um, by challenging that process as being in the public interest. So I, I, I suffered under that process. You know, the the, uh, the judge awarded costs, you know, to to Adani, and so I got lumbered with, you know, a, a great debt where Adani bankrupted me, and the state are, you know, responsible for that. The Queen, Queensland state government never at any point has the the, uh, the Labor government, the Palaszczuk government ever come to us and talk to us about, you know, what our grievances are, or you know, at any point and. Also, you know, the, the federal government has never spoken to us. And if we just look at recently, you know, the, the, the latest, uh, you know, the native title amendments, it was, um, it was basically to secure, you know, the, 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 the total, you know, defeat, annihilation, you know, the, the, you know, the, the death of the, you know, the, the McGlade decision and bury it completely because they, uh, they didn't know how to handle that. And so now through those amendments, we now have majority rules. So now we have a situation under native title where basically uh, when it comes to agreements, uh, mining agreements and uh, in Iliwas, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the uh, mining companies don't have to go to the claim group. So um, legislation says now they can go to the majority or go to the PVC. So here we go, we're, we're, we're doing away with uh, free prior informed consent where everybody has to be consulted. Everybody has to know what's going on in country, especially those law people, you know, the ones that, you know, that feel the country that are there, you know, that, uh, that practice, you know, the law and custom. These people are um, there, they become, you know, uh, excluded from the, the, the process. So once we've got, we've got a settler society deciding for us, What's right for us, uh, so that so that mining can go ahead. We're just we're just going back to, you know, um, John Howard's ten point scam. You know how you know mining um, comes before um, Aboriginal rights, and so they're the difficulties that I found with native title. Um, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of it. You know, there's uh, there's, there's too much ambiguities in it, and they need to go back to Marbo. If you really want to get this right. You really need to go back to Marbo and you really need to deal with uh, treaties with people, individual, individual, individual groups on individual country. They need to they need to make agreements with us, economic treaties or such. But, you know, that's that's still a long way off. You know, um, native title cannot deal with uh, compensation, royalties uh, or, you know, the injury, harm and loss that it causes to First Nations people in this country because, our people are suffering not only from the, the initial impact of, um, you know, the invasion and the colonization, you know, we, you know, we suffer again because, you know, we're being coerced, you know, into making agreements, you know, and, um, and then feeling sorry for it later on, you know, um, our, our people are sort of, you know, um, not in a position, you know, to negotiate because it's, it's always, uh, it, it's coming from, you know, the big end of town, you know, and uh, what they what they what they're considering. So, cultural heritage uh, management plans um, are another aspect of that. The state handles that here, so the state government has uh, a power over that that cultural heritage. And there isn't any registered cultural heritage sites in Queensland. 
I don't know why that is. We've got archaeologists um, working with traditional owners and, you know, uh, custodians, and um, there's just nothing really happening, you know. There's just no great push. And while we're all, you know, being um, lobbed into these, uh, you know, consent determinations and PBCs and, and these kind of things, you know, um, you know, we have to sit around and wait and, and the law people have to wait, you know, until somebody figures out, you know, uh, when we need to approach the government. I mean, we all know this and it's experienced this with the governments that, you know, you could you could be yelling at them till you're blue in the face, but they're not going to do anything until they work it out themselves. So I treat I treat them I treat the settler society like their little brothers and sisters. We're going to be patient with them and bring them along, but we have to educate them. And this thing, what's happening now, you know, um, heel heel country, you know, it's just another way of them saying that they can recognise that things are going wrong, but they don't know how to fix it because their legislation. Uh, doesn't it, it separates them from you know their their their, their personal views? So native title um, is not is not a good way of dealing with our rights, and so that um, that leg that legislation those amendments that have just been handed down a few months ago um, was just um, you know draconian as far as I'm concerned because. Um, you know, there's there's been there's been no real consultation. Um, they don't have time to. So, when it comes to our rights, um, we've just gone out and asserted our rights. You know, we don't we're not protesters. We don't protest. We keep getting labelled as protesters, but we're not. You know, we asserted our rights now, and you know, um, we went on to, we went on to country. Um, Adani doesn't have, have exclusive rights over the pastoral lease. We coexist. We went there and we took a parcel of that land and we just set a camp up and we've been living there and going back and forth unhindered. They try to get the, the Queensland police to, um, to come in and move us and to try to trespass us. The Queensland police were out of step with the Human Rights Act now, the 2019 Human Rights Act. We've since taken uh, them to conciliation to the Human uh, Rights Commission and they've given me a, um, a letter of regret over that issue. But here, here we see once again mining companies and, and, and the industry controlling the way legislation goes, and also using police, you know, uh, resources, you know, to try to subjugate our people and to control our people. But in this situation, you know, we uh, we got the upper hand and we won that. And so many of our people are, so many of our people I see in, in, in the country now, you know, they're still fighting just for rights to go out and fish and hunt, you know. And they're getting challenged all the time, you know, by parks and wildlife and, and, and police and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, um, under that under the federal native title legislation, section 44B1, um, these these uh, these rights are conferred to us that we we're able to uh, you know um, carry on in, in our traditional activities in the area. And um, you know, hunt and fish and gather food and have ceremony, and we don't have native title at the moment. And the, the government's doing so much to try to not destroy that native title claim. Um, but we've asserted our rights. We have the Queensland Human Rights Act now that I'm using now, currently against you know Queensland police and currently against the Queensland government because they're not respecting our water rights. And uh, um, Adani's got um, self-reporting rules that he governs himself. Queensland government um, have said clearly that you know um, they they wipe their hands of it and they can't do anything about investigating the the, the groundwater management. It's up to Adani. Um, we um, <clears throat> we currently have a story. We've got a complaint into the Queensland government that uh, that Adani is affecting the the, the, the water. With the, with the construction development of the mine. If it goes on any further, it's going to affect, you know, all the dreaming tracks, all the all the, the, the uh, aquifers and, and, and uh, you know, the, the springs out of the natural springs out of there. So uh, we just are asserting our rights. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about, the, you know, the, the free prior uh, informed consent, 
you know, a, a lot of people sort of, they just throw it around like, you know, um, it's something that, you know, that, that the United Nations can do or, you know, but it's, it's really a principle. And we, we have fundamental inalienable rights as human beings in this country. And it's, it's not based on native title and it's not based on any legislation. It's, it's based on our rights as First Nations people, you know, um, and you don't even have to be within a group of people. You've got culture, practicing your culture. You've got a right to go on your land and you've got a right to conduct mm. ceremony and culture. So that's what, that's what we're doing and we're asserting that. And so they're leaving us alone for the time being. The local council, the Isaac Regional Council, are working with us now to develop healing in the, this healing process. You know, they want us to be involved in NAIDOC this year for the first time. They've asked us. They're complying. They're agreeing. They're cooperating with us. We've asked to build a corroboree ground right there central to, you know, the entrance point to the town. The council is assisting us with sand and rocks and want to build uh, signs and things for us now. So we're working with, with them. And so with local government, once we get them on side, you know, then, um, you know, we, we can show people that we can work together. The mining companies are just too hard to work with. They're standovers and they, they think they can just like uh, boss our people around and tell us what to do. And the lawyers that, that, that they have, um, you know, they treat our people with disrespect. With uh, regard to like uh, climate change, I feel that our laws and customs, our, our First Nations, our law that goes back to time immemorial, the first law that's in the land, you know, is the, the, the basis for environmental protection. Now, it, when, we talk, when we talk about the law, it's sort of like the animals, the trees and the totems, they need to stay there. They're, they're our garden. They're our guide. They're our reference to, you know, the, the, the creation, the beginning of time, the beginning of all things. And that's our reference point and that's our law. We can't, we can't surrender that and they can't usurp that law. And they, they can't they can't do that, you know, and that's the thing that, you know, uh, you know, builds the foundation for, you know, uh, environmental protection, and working with other environmental groups, I always tell them that this is this is where, this is where you come from. As when you deal with us and you talk with us, you know, you're you're referring to our law and custom when it comes to the environment. It's not just saving a tree. Saving a, you know, uh, you know the frogs, or saving you know the, the, the environment. It's about uh, you're standing with us to protect our law and custom by acknowledging our protocols, by acknowledging our law and custom. You know, you're then joining with us, and this is how the reconciliation process works. So that's that's where I'm coming from. By protecting the environment, um, you're also joining us with our fight against climate change. So, you know, for us, I don't know too much about the whole science of it. Um, I have scientists that deal with all those issues and I delegate to them, but we've got to go, we've got to go a little, a little bit further and try to educate people about our worldview and where we're coming from. That seems to be the biggest problem at the moment because you know, um, they're undermining our decision-making processes, uh, which in turn makes us look like, you know, we, uh, you know, we're totally compliant to, you know, uh, you know whatever the state is telling us. And so um, that's that's sort of sort of where we are at the moment. Um, but we we still, you know, um, we still assert our rights. And now that people are wanting to work with us, local councils and so on, you know, we still we still get like Adani, you know, saying that they work with, you know, uh, segments of the, the traditional society and they claim them as their little Aborigines, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, when, when I speak, you know, um, against any, any destruction and, you know, any, any environmental, you know, breaches, you know, it seems to be like, um, I'm, I, you know, I should just be, you know, just 
excluded from anything and discarded and not be, not, not 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 identified or anything. So, you know, it's this this dispossession process coming along, and you know, uh, the state government, the state, the mining companies, they all just band together to try to silence the voice. But you know, um, I just keep talking. I just keep doing what I do. I just keep moving. Uh, and my my kids carry on with it. So yeah, we we want to we want to see the land looked after. You know, everybody knows natural springs are a sacred site. The Dungawula Springs are a a, a um, like a an area where there's about ten natural springs that uh, nobody knows where they come from. No one knows how it, it feeds the Kamapa River into the Baliando River, and still the Darning and still the state government do not. And cannot explain where the water comes from, and you know uh, how it's been like um, you know traveling through the country for millions, billions of years. And so, just recently, Adani um, um, lost a federal court decision to take water from the uh, from the Soto River. That was where he's going to use the water for the the uh, the wash down and the washing the coal. He's lost that. The uh, ACF um, beat the federal court, the federal government in that. And so we're still asking the question, where were you going to get the water from to wash down your coal? He's not telling anybody. And the government's saying that they don't have to. So we're putting pressure on the government and saying, leave our sacred site alone. Leave the water alone. That's the water spirit. It's the Mandanjara. It's the, it's the rainbow serpent dreaming runs through that country feeds and gives life to all of our totems and you know you destroy that you're going to destroy it you're going to affect our human rights yeah and, and that's such a big issue adrian especially when you look around the world in california in mexico um recently this uh week they were talking about mega droughts um you know and also as you mentioned climate change is such a big issue for indigenous peoples all over the world yeah. um just making sure that we're involved in those communications and those discussions worldwide so you know that's a really good point to to make and also i'll move on to anthony but what i'd like to do is also concentrate on some of those issues that we really need to deal with um anthony in regards to you know as Adrian was saying, transferring that knowledge to children and our families and to the wider Australian society, because we also need um, other Australians to understand exactly, you know, what um, we're experiencing on this country. So how can ordinary Australians in non-Indigenous society actually help some of these issues and support some of these issues, not lead these issues, um, they'll be Aboriginal led by communities. Uh, but how is that possible, Anthony? States are at different levels. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't got treaty here yet. Um, and um, other states have taken the lead on that. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen that um, they've targeted different areas and had different strategies for them. Um, and um, it's sad to see um, how government is treating the Indigenous um, First Nation people of Australia in um, different manner. So um, we, we um, get we um, one of the richest states, as um, Kato mentioned, um, the richest state in the world or in Australia, but um, we get treated at a cost of um, um, at our expense. So um, these are stuff that we need to over overturn. Um, and we've got our own battles within our state. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they're really concerning. Um, I, I did go through the process of what Adrian is going through, similar. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, at least we had um, strong cultural connection because um, within the Kimberley, within the last um, century that um, colonisation came up and um, all that changes. So a lot of the raw history and knowledge that we still have and mm -hmm. we fought hard towards... Um, towards the government and industry and we sort of um, never stu um, stood back for once. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's um, been a theme towards different regions and get special treatments um, than others, um, probably um, because of their knowledge. Um, 
because we didn't have TVs up here um, in the six uh, in the seventies. Um, they started to have colored TVs in the eighties, but um, yeah, so we're we're um, new towards what all of the other development around Australia. Um, so it's a challenge for us to actually gain a lot of knowledge in how we can work with government, work with industry um, in finding our place. So um, yeah. I had a question for um, um, by one of the viewers to... Um, oh, great. Yeah, so a huge... Um, uh, yeah, so they talked about our struggle and how can um, non-Indigenous people help um, you in the struggle. So we're looking at wanting to march on Parliament um, mm -hmm. next month um, and you put our message across towards them to say um, enough is enough. Um, we need um, other worlds or other places around the world that they've got treaty and um, work towards recognising their traditional owners. So Australia is um, coming to grips with that and how um, they're going to sort out our Indigenous people. I, um, but yeah, we, we, we want to do a march to demonstrate. We want to put more videos. Um, but yeah, look at our Facebook page. Uh, we've got more stories that are coming up. Um, and yeah, just to understand where we're coming from, we're trying to be a part of this um, finding um, the, how we fit into this Australia community. So if it's the Australian dream, then we need to incorporate it and we need to be treated fairly. Um, to be part of that society. But at this stage, we've got um, government putting up legislation to um, and lift legislation just to go into the NT um, with the intervention. So it just pulls off the act, um, the Discrimination Act, and went in there and done all of this stuff on false information. Um, we're getting attack on false information by government um, and ministers are... Uh, uh, running loose cannon towards making all of these allegations. So that, that, that needs to stop. Um, and That's excellent. And how can um, uh, Australians across the country um, find out about the, the protest and how can they add their support? Hopefully we'll have more things online. And where will that be, Anthony? Where will that be? We want to march on, on Parliament. We're looking at up to 100,000 people if they can come and join us. Oh, wow. Um, I know it'll be a restriction with COVID, mm. um, but we'd be asking um, our, all the families and friends and supporters throughout the state mm. to actually tell this government that um, it's unfair treatment in the way that they're mm. treating um, the Indigenous community at this stage. And these, these sort of issues are really important just as people walked over the bridge, Anthony, that they actually get involved and support uh, Aboriginal people, you know, in these issues. And, you know, Adrian's pointed out a lot of the issues that he has and also Cato. So um, that's the strength of what we need to actually get parliamentarians to listen to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, isn't it? Yeah, the uh, thing that everyone forgets is parliamentarians, politicians are the servants of the people. Hmm. And it's up to the people to actually hold their employees to account. Absolutely. That's as simple as that. Yeah. And is this a great way, Cato, to actually go out there and protest like those old days of Nukumbar? Is that the time again? Oh, there's, I think there's always room for, for protest. Uh, people say, oh, pro, you know, we don't need protest. But the minute you start making dis, uh, deals behind closed doors, uh, directly with government that uh, loses a lot of the accountability. So, you know, there's still a role to negotiate and uh, make agreements, but I think uh, people's movements and uh, getting out and letting our voice be heard is essential. Meaning of country, you know, why is it, and, and this is something that a lot of people ask across the nation um, that are, are non-Indigenous people, but why is water and, and being on country and land so important to us? Um, you know, that's in essence what people really need to understand, isn't it? Like Adrian was saying, you know, being on country, having those obligations. So how can we really put that message out again? 
Well, it's about uh, humans recalling who we really are and how we uh, come from the land, interact with the land, our resources come from there, our sustenance in all its forms, whether it's spiritual, emotional, psychological, physical. Um, and uh, basically reconnecting with the that, that part of us. So um, going into living in built up environments or cities or other places, we often forget uh, mm -hmm. of these connections, but uh, it doesn't take long before exposure back on country in the environment in uh, within a cultural framework as well, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. um, then, then you ignite these, uh, you know, things that are firmly part of our DNA. So it doesn't matter what racial background we come from or whatever. All humans have this uh, uh, aspect in our DNA that connects us back to the environment. We're part of it. Absolutely. And Adrian, your thoughts? Yeah, <clears throat> like, um, it, you know, I, I feel we have to bring all of Australians along with us. You know, um, you know, it's 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 really it's the government should be listening to the people, and you know, uh, the more people that we, you know, can, um, you know, uh, under get them to understand about you know what we're talking about, how it affects them, but like you know, it's not just uh, a, rain a rainbow serpent story that's connected to the water, that's connected to the animals. I mean, you know, that's that's our, our you know, metaphysical state of being and understanding of things, you know, we've got to try to get them to understand things scientifically. And, you know, it's, it's taking a while, it's taking years, but, you know, um, science is starting to, you know, to meet up in some areas, you know, where we're talking about, you know, how, how things are connected, you know, our song and dance and vibration and all these things, um, how, you know, our music, you know, um, you know, connects us. And the thing what I understand is like, you know, um, by us Aboriginal First Nations people connecting with the land, it makes us better human beings. You know what I mean? And and I mean, that 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 could be seen as religious. You know what I mean? So, you know, the more that we connect to our culture, the, the stronger that we become and other people can benefit from that. By us being removed from it and being dispossessed, and them killing and destroying our law and taking away our totems, um, you know, it takes away our point of reference, and that's that's dangerous. You know what I mean? Then, you know, there, there, there could be just this ongoing conflict, you know, with the, the settler society, you know, and uh, First Nations people, you know, and unless people, and it's up to the people, they have to want to come. We can't keep trying to just just yell at them in the street, you know. They have to want to come and learn. And so I believe that, you know, there will be a time and a period, you know, that these people are going to start to want to reach out to us mm. and learn more. Mm. Absolutely. And, and do you find too, like Anthony's mentioned about treaty, Adrian, do you see a, any um, good sense in going down the treaty path? Oh, well, you know, like I mentioned, like um, if we talk about Marbo, then... Uh, we have to go back, you know, to, you know, what Mabo was really about, you know, that we, we do, we do want to make some agreements, but, uh, you know, from what I understand, it has to be, you know, uh, a financial kind of thing, you know what I mean? So that when we're not, we're not begging, you know, we're not living in a welfare state, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. Um, if we if we're brought up to the same living standard, all the Aboriginal people in this country brought to the same living standard as you know an average working class Australian, then you know we can we can then make decisions for ourselves. While we're, while a lot of our people are living below the poverty line, you know they can be forced into making agreements, and you know um, that that's so treaty is, is a way to go, but it has to it has to bring us up to this to you know, that, that social level, you know, um, you know, economically. Mm, that makes total sense. And what about you, Cato? How do you feel about treaty and, and its place, um, you know, in the future or, you know, in another way that can serve us? 
Mm. I think Adrian's right. Uh, it's the golden rule. Uh, he mm. who controls the gold makes the rules. Mm. Um, my take on the treaty uh, discussion would be to cut through all of our conversations about a republic, about uh, changes to the constitution and all of that. The only time we really need to be seriously talking about a treaty is in the transition of Australia to a republic and a negotiated settlement between the settler peoples and the First Nations on how um, mm. this modern Australia should uh, pos be positioned in the world. And that does go back to matters of governance, but it also goes back to matters of control and access to resources. Um, and yeah. even the, the most basic thing that uh, we could start with is control over our education, because currently the genocide that's going on is the um, taking away See, the, the stuff you've heard Adrian talk about, which is quite uh, commonly held amongst uh, people in our generation, uh, with Anthony and myself and others, uh, the, this connection to country, connection to that culture. But that is progressively getting whittled away in each successive generation because we don't have the capacity to pass on and teach our children in that... Um, in, in those ways. So what's, uh, what, what I'm so lucky and fortunate to be is a Aboriginal person alive today, um, having access to that cultural knowledge. Um, I fear for future generations. And I think the, um, we do, that, that's one of our treasures that we can share with the entire world is this perspective that we have about um, our place in the universe at the particular sites that we um, live on and occupy. And that's essentially what it's all about. I mean, this, when we're talking about um, heritage and sites and all of that, our responsibility as custodians for those places is basically how those sites of immense spiritual metaphysical power interact with the dynamics of the universe. And that's the part of the responsibilities that we hold. So, you know, political solutions like treaties and all of that sort of stuff uh, would go to, uh, you know, addressing those political solutions. But I think in the hearts and minds and spirit, uh, we need to really double down on ensuring that our wisdom that we inherit from our elders can be passed on to our future generations and through the appropriate channels to other non-Indigenous people. So how, how important is it to everyone to actually work with other Indigenous peoples, you know, in the United Nations Permanent Forum or the Human Rights Council or, or other international um, uh, exchanges? How, how important is that to actually realise um, uh, uh, us being back on our land again? How important is that? It, it's critical. It's... Um, but it is a, uh, I mean, we're going through it and you think of it, it see the Jugan, so go back to Jugan. There's a hair belt lying at a level within the cave. It's 5,000 years old. There are descendants of that DNA testing, descendants of that uh, person whose hair went into making that belt alive today, uh, 5,000 years ago. We're talking about an Australia that's only just over 200 years old. So the stuff that we as Indigenous peoples hold and share across the world are insights and understandings that uh, transcend the temporary capitalist sort of market force driven uh, political agenda. And I think what's going on at the moment, you see with the, and this is where it's important in uh, environmental debate and futures and all of that is nature resets. Um, we have lived through as Indigenous peoples in Australia, we've lived through multiple environmental changes. So climate change is nothing new to us. It's in our rock art, it's in our oral histories, it's in our traditions. Um, but it's only 
uh, of concern really to the ignorant who have no knowledge and therefore they engage in fear. So that, that's the thing that's, and that's the, you know, essentially, I mean, I might be speaking out of turn and look to Adrian and Anthony, but um, it's the thing that we can contribute to uh, the world at large and other indigenous peoples around the world can do the same. And do you feel the same way, Anthony and Adrian? Is that sort of something that you would also see as a, a positive influence? Yeah. yeah they they um, need to know the stuff what we're really fighting for. Mm. Um, when we went through our NATO title that um, it's when the land was soft that um, a lot of the mountains and rivers got created. Mm. It was our society. Um, and this is thousands and thousands of years of knowledge and practice. So during the court proceedings, we had to demonstrate that we still continue to practice those, those knowledge those, those, um, um, of our heritage. Um, and that created a society where part of our dream time stories, plants and animals was in our story. Great. Uh, and we had to respect those stuff. So mm -hmm. that's my growing up into saying that, um, that was our society before colonization came in. And um, that all got changed. So overnight it got changed. Uh, and they are expecting us to forget our connection to country. Uh, I just feel it really um, discriminant um, to trying to wipe our race out. And we're the people of the Kimberley that had a society that been living here because of the new laws come in place. They want to take our land away and for us to have no say on it. Um, we as a race within the Kimberley, where do we fit? So we, we, we're fighting with government for our livelihood, for our future. Um, we've got all of these challenges that are coming into our region, which is just outrageous. Um, so um, yeah, we, we need to do settlements within our region, you know, treaty or settlements, um, but we need to tell the story. We're involved with the, the UN, uh, with the conversation, um, with the voice and such, and the, um, and the constitution, um, growing up in, the, in our community and our constitution, we didn't say um, that family is left out because they can't speak or read and write. Um, and that's discriminant to, to certain peoples within our community. So the, the constitution need to recognize everyone mm -hmm not have all of these laws to actually um, exclude us. Um, we did use the UN because the UN helped us um, around the world um, and it conveyed our message with the community closure. They wanted us to, to uh, move into towns and, um, and wiped all the communities down within the Kimberley and um, the Southwest throughout the state. And uh, it was just uncalled for. This state has, um, billions of dollars, multi-billions of dollars has um, um, survived the crisis and um, probably the only market uh, um, industry in the world that actually survived and made profit um, out, of the, out of our lands. And, uh, but that hasn't come back to us. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of truth telling that we need to do towards sorting out the stuff that we want for our region. We want um, guarantee that um, the constitution need to change. Um, and so there's a lot of settlement that we need to do across the board. Yeah, so Anthony, you raised truth telling and they've also used that as a very important tool in Canada. And this is a, a call to for truth telling in, not only throughout all communities throughout Australia. So but as we can hear those stories to also heal and then heal country. So how, how is it important is that process to really resetting um, relationship between everyone in this country? I guess um, um, Cato knocked it on the head that there need to be an educational process to what we are working towards. Um, we, we want to be recognised, we want to be um, have these rights that actually protect us, not to um, lock us up in jails. We've made recommendations decades after decades 
that just stood on the shelf and never been used towards addressing our social issues. Mm. Um, these are um, inquests that the government um, pushed forward and still never been listened to. They're your answers towards closing the gap and the other social issues that we've got. Mm. Um, I just feel that this government has just shafted um, everything that we've tried to do and attempt towards uh, addressing a lot of the social issues and the constitution and that that need to change we, we need the australian um, mm. public to support us they, they supported us on the community closure and they need to um, support us with the constitution uh, we just mm. want simple things that um that has been played mm. with by government to um, make us look like a bad people mm. And just a question to everyone, you know, this year particularly, the United Nations strengthening languages, Indigenous languages, um, how important is it not only to our community, but also for, as we've seen in um, Aotearoa, for the Māori, um, that language, Indigenous language, Aboriginal languages, um, also have a role in our schools, in our high schools, um, and with our community and, and with our people teaching how important is that in Australia? Adrian, go first. Yeah, I, I just think that, um, you know, we're always expected to compromise, you know what I mean? Um, and if we don't, you know, they have to, co you know, coerce us, you know what I mean? And then it, I mean, it becomes violence against us and then forced assimilation, you know, and dispossession. You know, why, why do they ask us to compromise for everybody else, you know, you know, uh, I think, you know, you know, the, the real foundation is t taking these, uh, these uh, culture, culture and language, you know, to, to schools uh, and educating, you know, the, the general public, but also, you know, strengthening our communities with our young people to, to say that, that, you know, their cult that culture is a vehicle, you know, that language is a vehicle for culture and it's very important for our society you know, not to compromise that. And, and I mean, I've always said that, you know, speaking Aboriginal language in this country is a political statement. So, you know, they, you know, they try on the east coast of Australia, you know, on, on, in Queensland, you know, uh, our people suffered, you know, you know, tremendous, like, you know, violence against us, you know, forced us off our land. And, you know, my grandfather and father experienced, you know, that, you know, uh, getting floggings and stuff, you know, for speaking their language. You know, but as as this resurfaces now and that, that old language, you know, is is being sought and, and learned, you know, we feel a lot, a lot more pride and self-esteem coming, you know, in our young people. And then, you know, handing that on to the general population. Young, you know, young Australians, kids today, you know, young Australian kids, they, they're hungry and they, they thirst for knowledge and they want to learn. You know what I mean? And I think... You know they can help their parents then to, you know, to have a better understanding. But they would, they will be, they will be the future. You know, mm. you know, um, 30, 40 years down down the track, you know, they they're going to probably be the, the politicians in the parliament. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that, that's the way I've always seen it. You know, we we can't just keep compromising and bending over backwards for everybody else and. Just expecting that you know they got they know what's right for us and they're going to keep doing it. We have to bring what makes us proud and what gives us you know the, the strength as a people and be proud of it and stand up and and assert that and, and show the world. And if they want to learn, let's show them. Let's take it to the school and show them. So. Well, Virginia, I wanted to add to that is. Um... I know Anthony's uh, father, when I first met him many years ago, he can speak 13 Aboriginal languages. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother can speak nine. Um, I'm impoverished. I get away with uh, roughly about three. Um, but it's critical, the comment that Adrian just said, mm -hmm. speaking an Australian language so that's something we need to remember. These are Australian languages, uh, is a political statement. And here in Western Australia, there's no, absolutely no excuse whatsoever for not teaching Australian languages in the schools 
in the countries in which those uh, schools occupy. The New Zealand experience, you get crusty Kiwis who are the old colonial settler whitefellas who were born before uh, the introduction of te reo into the curriculum. They're a completely different person to the young white Kiwi who's gone through a uh, te reo program at, uh, in the education system. So speaking language is absolutely critical to any anything, whether it's a connection to country, connection to spirituality, connection amongst each other. I mean, the, the whole thing, all our, you notice in the desert, a lot of the languages ends with jara. Jara means with these. So these languages are with that particular term or that uh, feature, it's that expression. And so that's how people identify is based on the language languages, which are rooted to the land and which were brought there by Dreamtime ancestors. So yeah, it's, it's critical. Um, thank you for your thoughts. And Anthony? Um, yeah, it, it's, I, I, some of my version of it, it was calling it um, living in two worlds. But it's one world, but having two cultures. Other cultures have, um, with, throughout the world, has le learned their culture and um, spoken English. So why can't we do it here in Australia? Um, my dad um, has um, learned language um, and would, um, is a hard worker and, and lived within this, this English world, um, this European world. And um, yeah, so he brought us up with values and such. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it does work. Um, I do worry about the curriculum these days that kids are spending so much education um, for 12 years, um, if they go to year 12, um, and what they get out of it. We have to reprogram them to actually tell them the real story um, and where they're from, their identity. And a lot of the studies we're doing is um, the kids are asking for their culture and the culture gives them identity who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, if they're happy to be American, they're happy to be English and Irish, mm. and we should be happy to be Australian, then let's celebrate an educational system that actually, and curriculum that actually works with us. Um, there's no harm in it, um, and it, it upskills the, of our group, and um, I, I can't see why government is stopping us to go into these schools and reset the curriculum to actually get, have better outcomes with our youth. And I guess when you look back um, on NADOC week, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks or a month or six months' time, you know, what's the, the big takeaway for all of you um, to, to really give hope um, that we can actually have some of these really big issues um, have really positive solutions? What's one thing in that hope? Uh, just the conversation, keep talking, education. Yeah. It's, it's incumbent, it's uh, important that people actually educate themselves. Um, I think that's one of the key things that uh, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are sick of is having to educate people on the basic uh, experiences. And if uh, it's important that people go away and do some self-education and reflection before they come back and seek to engage. And Adrian, do you agree with that? Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm just thinking like, you know, we we had various forms of communication. We like, you know, a very complex, uh, you know, non-verbal communication, you know, Aboriginal people just have that, you know, we have a certain way of communicating, we don't even speak. So the thing is, communication is the, is the problem here. You know, they, they, they refuse to come and communicate with us and try to find out things, you know. So communication is a big thing. And we've got to have things like this, you know, more conferences where, you know, uh, people can come in contact with this kind of thing. You know, uh, decision makers and, and things like that. Because, you know, uh, the way I see politicians in this country um, just making, uh, passing legislation 
uh, they don't seem to want to communicate with anybody. They just think that, you know, well, um, they've made their mind up about it. Um, real consultation means to sit down and communicate with the people, you know, from the land. And uh, that's, that's not happening, you know, um, as far as I can see. So they have to communicate more with, with us to understand us, I think. So. Thank you, Adrian. And Anthony, and your thoughts on this? There need to be more platform like this, so we get mm -hmm. engagement. Um, mm -hmm. But at a higher level with government, that they mm -hmm. need to put the voice in there. We need to have a voice to make government accountable um, and to put our message across there that this is an issue, we need to deal with it. Um, they've been handling a lot of the issues for centuries and decades, um, and they've made no changes. So they mm. admit decades after decades that they haven't closed the gap. So if, if there is need to be changes, then um, sit with us. Let us co-design it. Um, and, um, but yeah, uh, the voice need to happen at a higher level, um, right down to the regional level, so at all levels. So, um, but yeah, government need to st take that step in allowing us to have a voice in truth telling. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and being so generous and so patient. And we wish you a happy <laughs> NAIDOC week and Marambangbala, you're deadly. <laughs> And thank you so much. And I know everybody listening tonight will really come away with something special that they didn't realise before and they hadn't listened to. So keep safe. Galio. Mm. Thank you.